and welcome. Uh, thank you all for joining us. My name is Jordan Money. I'm the Director of Events and Communications for the Center for Security Studies and Security Studies Program. As you all know from many Zoom sessions previously, um, do keep yourself <laughs> muted when you're not speaking. Um, and we encourage you to have your camera either on or off, um, particularly during the Q&A portion. We know that many of you may be eating lunch or something right now, so don't feel obliged to have it on. Um, we will have plenty of time for Q&A as we get toward the end of the presentation. Um, you're encouraged to either use the raise hand function within Zoom, or you can submit questions in the chat, and I will ask them out loud for you. Um, and finally, this session is being recorded. So just keep that in mind that anything you say out loud will be recorded, as will your video if you choose to turn it on while you are speaking. Um, and with all of that out of the way, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Zachary Abuza, who is a professor at the National War College and also an adjunct professor here at the Center for Security Studies, where he teaches our course on Southeast Asian security issues. Um, and I suspect several of his students are in the audience right now, as they were the ones who suggested this talk. Um, I have a longer bio for him, but I've been instructed to keep it quite short since we are starting a little late. So I will go ahead um, and say simply that we are in great hands today um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Abuza. And I will be sharing my screen in just a moment. Thank you very much for having me um, and thanks for taking some time out of your lunch. Uh, my standard uh, uh, disclaimer that these are my views and not the views of the National War College or the Department of Defense or the US government. Um, look, uh, what I wanna do today is talk very briefly about why the coup happened, uh, what has happened since the coup and uh, what the end game is for the generals and then conclude with what it means for the international community. Um, if we're trying to understand why the coup, the, the fact is that this has always been a very difficult country to govern. Um, it has been at war with itself uh, since its founding in 1948. Indeed, the Tatmadaw, the uh, Burmese military, um, predates the founding of the state. It was actually established uh, by the, uh, the Japanese during World War II. Um, Aung San was trained uh, in Japan. Um, when he negotiated independence for the country in 1948, he very quickly began uh, uh, negotiating with the various ethnic groups in the country um, about forming a, a union of Myanmar, or back then it was the Union of Burma, um, in, an, in return for significant autonomy. You can see that Burmans actually dominate the population, around 68% of the population. Uh, all the other minorities uh, have been uh, systematically mistreated. Um, they have resisted uh, Rangoon and now Nepidaw's uh, control. Um, and there has been significant war uh, since then. There's never been a period of time where the Burmese military has not been fighting one or more ethnic groups. Um, so that gives the military this huge role in society. They truly believe that they are the only organization in the country that can hold this country together. Next slide, please. Um, the uh, military took over in 1962 when Ne Win threw his coup d'etat. Uh, he was put out to pasture in 1988, and uh, um, there was this opening. Uh, the students took to the streets, were demanding democracy, and it's at this time when Aung San Suu Kyi, the daughter of the founder of the country, was home from the United Kingdom to take care of her ailing mother. She was recruited to put together a political party and contest democratic elections in 1989, which she dominated. The military quickly annulled the elections and threw her in prison, uh, where she remained for well over a decade. Next slide, please. Um, in 2007, we saw another mass demonstration that was brutally cracked down by the military. This one was uh, known as the Saffron Revolution uh, because it was led by the Buddhist clergy. Uh, again, the military had absolutely no compunction about putting this down with incredible violence. Next slide, please. 
um, we saw that the military ruled uh, after uh, uh, the, putting down the 88 rebellion from 1992 to 2011, uh, General Tan Shui was in charge. Um, you can see during this time, a couple things happened. The size and budget of the military increased dramatically. Um, so it became a much more totalitarian state involved in all sectors of society. Uh, the military really began to control vast uh, holdings of mineral wealth, of, of forest land, mines. Um, and so the budgets that we have are truly guesstimates. Uh, there is so much off the book accounting that we have no idea what their budget really is. But we know the military grew in strength. It was incredibly repressive uh, during this era. Next slide, please. Um, you can see the major ethno-linguistic groups that it was fighting during this period of time. Next slide. In 2008, the uh, military uh, uh, had uh, began their reform program, and they um, uh, had a new constitution that was ramroded through uh, uh, um, the uh, parliament and a national referendum. Um, it was not a true democratic constitution. It enshrined considerable powers for the military. Um, everything from guaranteeing the military 25% of the seats in parliament, it took away from civilian oversight, um, uh, uh, promotions, personnel decisions, the budget, it handed the military three key ministries, the Ministry of Defense, Interior, um, and, you know, it really made the military a state within the state. One of the two vice presidents was appointed by the military. So there was a lot of skepticism and a lot of cynicism at the time that this actually was going to go anywhere. Next slide, please. Um, we know that the military continued to grow its um, uh, budget in this period of time. Again, we don't have really good figures. Um, they've never come clean on their official budget and so much is offline. Next slide, please. This was the picture that really convinced Burmese that something was different. Uh, Su Chi was allowed out of house arrest and here she was photographed at the president himself, a general, um, house having dinner. Um, and there they are posing before the portrait of her father, the founder of the country, the founder of the military. And it was only in 2014 when Burmese really began to believe that, that reform was meaningful and that things would happen. Next slide. So we saw elections in 2010 that the National League of Democracy boycotted. They, they said it was a charade. By 2012, though, they were convinced that there was more hope for democracy, and they began to uh, uh, run candidates. And then you can see at the top in 2015, they not just contested uh, elections, they dominated. So you can see that 25% of the seats on the left in brown that the military held. Um, but to the right of the NLD, you see this lighter brown. That's the Union Solidarity and Development Party. That is the military's political party. So um, other than what they commanded in parliament, they did not have much support. Next slide, please. Now, during this period of time, we also saw the ethnic cleansing of the uh, Muslim Rohingya population, which the military uh, has denied being one of the uh, legal minorities in the country, not entitled to citizenship, and actually denies that the Rohingya even exists. They are referred to as illegal Bengalis. Next slide, please. And I'm sure many of you recall the shocking uh, photos of this time from you know, over 300 
villages burnt to the ground, uh, men uh, who were uh, uh, gunned down uh, by security forces and the mass rape of women uh, during this time. It was a clear case of ethnic cleansing done by the Tatmadaw. This is a regime that has never hesitated to use force on its own population. Next slide, please. Um, and that, of course, has led to the largest refugee crisis in the world. Over a million uh, uh, Rohingya are now in an intractable situation in neighboring Bangladesh. Next slide. And Su Chi, of course, uh, seen here in December uh, 2019, um, defending her own military before the International Criminal Court at The Hague. And just the, the, the shocking juxtaposition of a Nobel Prize laureate uh, defending uh, her own military for crimes against humanity. Um, and a, a lot of people really wondered why, what, what, what's in it for her? Um, you know, she is a Burmese nationalist. Uh, she, her father was the founder of the military. Um, no one was really willing to stand up for the Rohingya at the time. Most people didn't really like them. It was not a vote getter. Um, but more to the point, I think she really realized she had so much political capital to use. And her real motivation was constitutional reform. Next slide, please. And specifically, what was that constitutional reform? Uh, she wanted to figure out how to amend the Constitution to get the military out of politics, uh, take away their seats in Parliament, uh, to uh, uh, restore civilian oversight over the military and security forces, um, to uh, block the military's ability to, to uh, amend the Constitution, um, all these things. Um, and she was getting fairly close. They did some uh, polling in 2019, and there she is winning 62, 64% of the vote in parliament. Um, again, there is a 75% threshold to amend the constitution in Burma. She's far from it, um, but not that far. Next slide which gets us to the elections last November when her party goes on to not just uh, uh, win, but win even more. And you can really see that the Union Solidarity and Development Party, the military's party, actually really loses seats in this one. Um, now, pay attention to the circle down uh, at the bottom and that is uh, uh, elections that were canceled. Next slide. So when we get from the uh, 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 November elections that Su Chi dominates, she's getting closer and closer to meeting that 75% threshold to amend the constitution, the military really views democracy as an existential threat. Um, the justification for the coup was of course election fraud. We've heard that before. Um, the uh, real reason, and going back to the last slide, they said, well, there weren't elections allowed to be held in certain regions because of ongoing wars. Um, there were other reasons though. Um, uh, the top general of the Tatmadaw was slated due to retire. He had reached his age limit. And this is a, a very common thing in Southeast Asia. Generals uh, don't seem to have much qualms about overthrowing constitutions, but they, they do have a lot of qualms about going against military regulations. Um, and so uh, there was a lot of concern that should he step down as the commander in chief, he would lose a lot of wealth. His children who have vast economic holdings would lose a lot of their wealth and, and power. Um, and at the very bottom of the day of the coup, there was this shocking video that went viral in Myanmar of uh, General Hang's son making it rain, showering money down uh, at his company because he was so happy about the coup. Next slide, please. So there's definitely some personal 
motivations for the coup. It's not just that the military saw this as an existential threat. Now, what has happened since the coup? The first is president uh, of the NLD uh, party was arrested. Um, one of the vice presidents also of the NLD has been arrested. The vice president from the military is now the acting president. Um, the uh, top leadership of the NLD are now in jail, the top four leaders. Um, and this is important because they are not young people. Uh, they are all in their mid 70s. And I think there's clearly an interest by the military in trying to wait them out. Uh, the military has appointed their own cabinet. Uh, they have declared a state of emergency for one year. Uh, I'm not sure anyone really believes that. But what we're really seeing is an increase in violence. Uh, we have had uh, getting close to 200 people killed as of today, if not more. Um, over 2,175 have been arrested. Um, next slide, please. And of course, uh, the end game for the generals, I uh, do not believe uh, that they will hold on to power um, in terms of a military coup forever. But, but I think the real end game uh, is that they are looking towards what the generals did in Thailand following the 2014 coup. Yes, there they delayed the restoration of democracy from the promised two years to five years. But what the Thai generals did was gerrymander, malapportion the vote, rewrote the constitution, making large parties uh, 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 unviable, uh, uh, went after the uh, opposition figures, uh, legally disbanded political parties. They uh, uh, have saddled uh, the opposition figures with all sorts of lawsuits and, and um, uh, other court cases. They have banned politicians from politics for everything from five years to life. Um, and they have used a host of national security laws and regulations, including the Computer Crimes Act and uh, Les Majeste, uh, to weaken the opposition in Thailand. Um, and I think that's exactly what the uh, uh, military in Burma seeks to do. Um, they are trying to figure out how they can establish a minority government. You are going to see a shift in the constitution. Uh, it is going to allow for much greater uh, 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 proportional uh, uh, representation um, that will give the, the military much greater say. And they will find all sorts of legal means to weaken the NLD, to hamstring uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, large parties. And again, I think they largely want to wait some of the NLD leadership out. Uh, Suu Kyi is 75. The other NLD leaders are in their mid-70s. And frankly speaking, the NLD has done a really terrible job at cultivating a next generation of leadership who is known at the national level. Next slide, please. So other things that we have seen and what the generals were probably not expecting was the civil disobedience movement and just how massive it has been. It has been across the country, not just in uh, uh, the main cities of Yangon or Mandalay. Um, it has been in smaller cities. We have seen civil disobedience movement in the military constructed capital um, that has very few residents in it. Um, we have seen uh, disobedience in small townships. We have seen it in ethnic uh, 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 regions dominated by some of the ethnic minorities. Next slide. 
Now, the big thing is, of course, the level of violence. And some of you have probably seen this shocking footage of ambulance corps members being beaten uh, uh, senseless by security forces uh, simply for taking wounded uh, civilian protesters away. Next slide. I think many of you have seen footage of things like this, uh, not just soldiers deployed, but soldiers with sniper rifles. Um, simply there to take pop shots at uh, uh, members uh, of the civil disobedience movement to terrify them. Um, and we have seen this. Next slide. Some of you have uh, uh, um, saw the news that this 19-year-old girl was shot uh, dead by sniper fire uh, leading the protests so that they're willing to go after the next generation, the best and the brightest of society is, is frankly, knowing the Tatmadaw's history, not a real shock. Next slide. Um, yesterday, there was news that this civil society activist um, uh, had been tortured to death. Um, the telltale signs uh, of, of um, toxic substance uh, pumped into his stomach and mouth melting. So the Tatmadaw is very clearly trying to terrorize society, trying to drive the civil disobedience movement home. Uh, and they are not being shy about it. Next slide. Um, just before uh, 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 giving this presentation, I saw this news that uh, martial law has been declared in certain uh, locations in the country, um, which gives the military the ability to try civilians in military courts um, and including imposing the death penalty. Uh, so the military is definitely ratcheting up the pressure on society. Next slide, please. Um, this will have an impact on the economy. And uh, uh, we know that foreign investors are leaving. Uh, we know that uh, the economy is drawing to a standstill. We have seen civil society um, uh, uh, or civil disobedience in uh, the port workers, uh, transportation workers, the railway workers have been on strike. Uh, medical staff have been on strike. So we know that this is going to have a real hit on the generals. The generals, however, feel that they are sufficiently isolated, that their wealth and privileges are protected. And frankly, they ran the country into the ground in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, and didn't, didn't bother them. Um, Myanmar, when it became independent, was the wealthiest country in Southeast Asia. It was the one most primed for success. They had no compunction about running it into the ground as long as their interests were protected. Next slide. Um, so what does this mean for the insurgent conflicts? Uh, well, it's bad. Uh, we know, for example, the Karen National Union has been welcoming uh, uh, policemen who, uh, and soldiers who have defected. Um, the Kachin Independence Army is uh, 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 maintaining a wait and see approach. Um, uh, the Arakan Army, uh, which has really uh, hurt the military more than any of the ethnic groups in the past couple of years, um, has a tentative ceasefire. We'll see how long it, it lasts. And of course, the government uh, uh, could but is unlikely to deal with the return of that million uh, member uh, Rohingya community now in Bangladesh. So overall, I, I don't see this being very good for the ethnic armed movements around the country. The other side of the coin is, you know, some people are hopeful that says, look, Su Chi and her democratic government really didn't do a great job at negotiating peace and the, the real power players is the military. So they might be a better negotiating partner. And as the military is so diplomatically isolated around the world, one thing they can kind of do to allay criticism of the coup is uh, to negotiate peace with ethnic armed groups. I'm just very cynical. Uh, there's a reason this military has been at war with its population since 1948. It's good for their interests.
Next slide, please. Uh, we also have to be very concerned about the radicalization of uh, or the use and abuse of the more radicalized clergy, uh, such as uh, the Mabata and people like Wiratu. This was the monk that really led the uh, charges against uh, the uh, Rohingya community that incited violence. And in fact, some of the first Facebook crackdowns uh, that we saw on incitement to violence uh, were in Myanmar because of uh, this monk. Um, most of the Buddhist clergy will be with the people, will be with the civil disobedience movement, but there are, is a small group that is closely tied to the military and will back the military and try to give them legitimacy. And we have to pay attention to them because they have incited violence against minorities in the past. Next slide. All right, the big thing that we have to look for within Burma is whether there is dissension within the ranks. Um, to date, the Tatmadaw has held together, but as a strategic intelligence question, we really have to wonder, um, was the coup simply the decision of the very top of the military leadership, kind of the last people who had ties to the Slork era in the 1990s? Or is this a decision that was accepted across the officer corps? My guess is it's the former and not the latter. So far, the military has held firm and stayed together. They don't have a very good record of um, uh, factionalism or breaking apart. Um, the senior leadership certainly knows how to buy these guys off, but this is a very different era. You know, for the past 10 years, Burma has been opening up to the outside world. These guys are more exposed. Their children have been more exposed. There's been so much hope um, and zeitgeist, positive zeitgeist in the country for the development of the country. Um, the... There has been a free press. There has been an internet. The social media is ubiquitous. Um, and I think these guys are, are, have grown up. The younger kind of colonels and younger um, are very concerned about um, the crackdown, especially if it is prolonged. The senior generals have their economic interests protected. These guys are going to start feeling the squeeze. This is the one thing I really want to watch in the coming year, especially as this um, becomes more pro prolonged. Next slide, please. All right, so what does this mean to the neighboring countries and the international community? The big question is for China. Um, China uh, has mixed relations with Myanmar. It's a very complicated relationship during the Slork era. They were really the, the key diplomatic ally. They provided arms, political cover for the junta. And yet the junta was very wary of their over-dependence on China. Um, they were very concerned about uh, uh, Chinese uh, leverage in their economy. Um, and after the genocide of the Rohingya, um, when Su Chi was no longer the darling of the West, um, she found it very convenient to go to China and meet with Xi Jinping and to ink uh, all sorts of deals uh, 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 for the Belt and Road Initiative projects in Myanmar. China was against the democratization of Burma. They were not for it in 2015, but they learned that they could work with Su Chi and she protected their economic interests. Next slide. China is not a fan of the Burmese military. Um, they believe the generals to be feckless and corrupt, incompetent managers. Um, and yet they control a lot of natural resources that Chinese uh, will use. Uh, we, most of you are familiar that the Chinese have uh, built a uh, pipeline, a parallel oil and gas pipeline across Myanmar to avoid the Strait of Malacca into southwestern China. Um, this 
uh, past few days, we have seen increases in attacks on Chinese factories uh, causing damage. Uh, 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 and uh, so the Chinese are getting a little concerned about what's happening there. The other thing that has long concerned the generals in Myanmar about China is that they have uh, been arming some of the ethnic groups around the country. It's not all the central government. Sometimes the Yunnan government has their own foreign policy going on. It, it, it's not clear. But one thing that's very important to understand about Myanmar is that the general public believes that China is behind the generals and perceptions matter. Next slide. So now we get to the question of what is, what about ASEAN? Um, we have seen uh, some diplomacy on the part of Indonesia to resolve the conflict, have very low expectations. The Indonesians are very well-meaning. Uh, I, I hope they can make progress. They will not make progress. The problem is ASEAN is woefully divided on this. Uh, we have four of the 10 countries who have condemned the coup, um, but not done much more than condemn it. Uh, we have six members who have either supported the coup or have been largely silent, and ASEAN is a consensus-based organization that prides itself on non-interference in internal affairs. Next slide. ASEAN, however, is in a position where they could do something. The largest single investor in ASEAN is Singapore. Um, Thailand is a major investor. Malaysia, Brunei, Vietnam are all key investors there. So should ASEAN want to do something, they could. Singapore is the country that has the most leverage. Um, it is where the generals do their banking. It is where they get their health care. It is where they send their children for schooling. Um, and yet Singapore seems very unlikely and unwilling to use the leverage, uh, perhaps a bit more quietly behind the scenes, um, but there is much more they could be doing. Um, next slide. Um, the big question for me is we're starting to see Burmese diplomats defect. We've uh, recently had the second one here in DC from their embassy. We've had uh, uh, Burmese uh, general, uh, excuse me, uh, diplomats in the United Kingdom defect. Um, this could be an interesting avenue for um, ASEAN and put them in a bind. What happens? Do they, uh, are they all on board in recognizing the coup? I'm not sure. And then it asks, we, it begs the question, what happens when you have an ASEAN meeting and you have contending diplomats uh, 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 show up, one representing the junta, the other representing the ousted government? Um, so I could see very uncomfortable situations emerge in ASEAN and elsewhere. Next slide. The real issue that might change ASEAN behavior, of course, is the drugs trade. Uh, Myanmar is the major source of metamphetamines in all of South and East Asia. It is one of the largest producers of metamphetamines in the world, and production is soaring. Uh, this year. The generals have long gotten a cut from this, and as the economic uh, sanctions start to bite on the country, they might become more dependent on uh, the export of illicit narcotics. That could change ASEAN's behavior uh, and attitudes towards the coup. Next slide. And we have seen huge increases in uh, uh, seizures of not just the drugs out of Myanmar uh, in 2020, uh, uh, but huge seizures of uh, the precursor uh, chemicals for the drugs trade. This is big business. This is what keeps the generals afloat. This is what allows them to evade sanctions. Next slide. So let's finish up here. What's the US government to do? 
This is a very difficult one. It happened within 10 days of a president uh, taking office in the United States. Um, a lot of the foreign policy team uh, of the Biden administration are veterans of the Obama administration, and the democratization of Myanmar was one of their key victories. Um, in fact, if you look at the recently declassified Trump administration uh, strategy for Asia, they don't say very much about Southeast Asia by name. One of the few countries they mentioned there is Myanmar and defending democracy in Myanmar was stated as one of our uh, priorities. Um, and I, I think that remains true. The United States has imposed targeted sanctions on the military, on their military owned corporations, mm -hmm. uh, in particular five uh, that, that dominate the economy, but we know of hundreds out there. Um, that, that uh, are active in the Myanmar economy. Recently, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York uh, froze $1 billion in uh, Myanmar government assets uh, that the, the generals were trying to shift out of the country. Um, there are an estimated five to $6 billion in Myanmar assets in uh, banks overseas. It's just not clear that the Americans have enough leverage or can get the Japanese or the Singaporeans or the Swiss or, or the Cayman Islands uh, to, to start to seize significant assets. Um, and then late last week, uh, the US government issued temporary pro protective status um, with, in sharp contrast to the Trump administration and that simply allows Myanmar nationals who are in the United States now, whether they be students or businessmen, uh, to not uh, have to return uh, when their visas expire. Um, so it gives them some uh, a sanctuary. It's not opening up the door for refugees, though. The United States will start to take refugees again, and, and that is important, and I hope other countries follow suit. Uh, so let me end uh, there and, and just uh, take questions. Folks, you are welcome to either use the raise hand button or you can put your questions in the chat. Uh, Kyoko, go ahead. Thank you, Professor Buza, for hold, holding this talk. Um, one question I have is um, if there's any room for US-China cooperation in terms of handling Myanmar? That's a great question. Is there room? Sure. Is it room that would be uh, uh, used? Uh, we'll see. Um, look, we, we just had the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense in uh, Japan, in Korea, um, and you know, the emphasis has been on restoring and rebuilding our alliances that were under such incredible strain the past four years. Um, those countries clearly have uh, concerns about Myanmar. Uh, they uh, 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 obviously want to protect their economic interests and holdings in the country. Um, but the priority for the United States with them is, is largely China. Um, the United States has a host of challenges with China. Um, everything from North Korea to uh, South China Sea aggression to what the Chinese are doing in Hong Kong or against the Uyghurs to intellectual property theft. Um, I can go on trade wars. Uh, you know, the United States really does need to find places where we have common ground with China. 
Um, I think we do have to start to build a more positive relationship with them and, and find areas of common interest. Um, I know the general cynicism is that the Chinese are, if not behind the coup, uh, uh, supportive of it. I just don't think that's true. Um, the Chinese are supportive of any government. They, they're very flexible. They're very pragmatic. They could work with Su Chi as long as they, she protected and advanced China's interests. And, and she did. Um, and I, I'm concerned, you know, the Chinese will live with the generals and, and they'll, they'll figure it out. But it, it doesn't mean that it's really good for, for China. Now, to what degree the Chinese and Americans might cooperate? Uh, other than both wanting an end to violence, I'm not expecting very much. Um, <coughs> the Chinese <coughs> are not going to sanction the generals. They are not going to crack down on their bank accounts in Chinese financial institutions. Um, the Chinese are not going to support UN resolutions condemning the generals, I, I don't think. Um, so <clears throat> I could see some degree of coordination, um, certainly on, on paper and in public statements, but I, 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 I have low expectations. Um, it's too bad because this is actually a place where, where the two sides are not completely apart. What other questions do folks have? Uh, we have about another 10 minutes or so with Dr. Abuza, so please do take your uh, opportunity to ask questions. Um, and I was just going to suggest that you try turning your camera on and seeing if it would hold up for us, the audio oh, should be good. What should students or, you know, alumni, whoever is interested in this topic, what should folks be looking out for um, as they watch the news in the coming weeks and months? Um. Well, first of all, we're going to see a lot more violence. So the, the, the bloodshed and the news of the crackdown, so those kind of 30 more people killed over the weekend is going to become commonplace. And sadly, uh, it's going to become normalized in the press. And, and I think we cannot lose sight of the fact that these are human lives and, and there is going to be a lot of violence. Um, as I said, the thing that as someone from my vantage point for the US government and the Department of Defense, what I look for is any signs of schisms within the Myanmar military. The more the violence is taking place against unarmed civilians and spreading across the country, I think there is more avenue for some of that dissent uh, to trickle up. The United States government must, and working with Japan working with ASEAN uh, partners must think about off ramps for the generals. Um, and that's not going to be easy to do, but we, we really do need to think about ways that they can um, uh, uh, de-escalate the situation and uh, have a status quo ante. And finally, what I'd look for is, are we starting to see more support, especially from the Singapore government uh, and, and a few others to uh, uh, cooperate on some of the sanctions and, and, and financial pressure on the regime? Uh, it would be great if, for example, the Japanese government uh, started to uh, uh, freeze some of the uh, government's assets sitting there in the Bank of Japan. I, I'm not sure we're going to get there. Um, we saw one Japanese firm, uh, the brewer Kirin, uh, 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 announced that they were going to stop uh, 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 their involvement in Myanmar. They actually uh, um, 
that's a, that's a really important sign. Um, Japanese firms are not known for taking stances on human rights and democratization. Um, if we start to see an exodus of Japanese firms, that, that might be a very important tell. Any other questions? Uh, Mentawab, you had your hand up. Did you want to ask a question or did it get answered? Yeah, it was kind of touched on. Um, I was basically asking, you know, given what you've described in terms of the military's likelihood to hunker in and not back down necessarily, what are potential gains are there for protesters who continue to come out on the street sort of despite knowing how much of an iron fist they're dealing with on the other side of this conversation, but you talked a little bit about how some of that can possibly trickle up and that there are potential off ramps for generals. I'm just wondering from the public side sort of what protesters can expect. And before you answer uh, that, I might um, we might combine it a bit with the question in the chat right now. Uh, both the military and the protest movement seem to be entrenched in their positions as the situation starts to resemble a stalemate. Do you see any potential for talks between the two sides? Yeah. Um, right now, you have the military really underestimated the degree to which society has changed. Um, the exposure to the outside world, the exposure to uh, a free media, um, uh, traveling, uh, the uh, growth of the economy uh, in the past few years, and, and just the development in cities like Yangon and Mandalay, um, the expectations are very high. High, You know, back in 1988, when they cracked down, there was no social media, no internet. Expectations were really low, um, and the military could act with total impunity. And I, I think they're, the military is really taken aback um, by the scope and scale. It's not just students protesting. It's the civil disobedience of workers uh, around the country, in every corner of the country. They, you know, it's sort of like in Thailand, the, the military there expects the students in Bangkok to protest. What they're not expecting is nationwide protests. And that's just what the Myanmar government has gotten. So what do the students, it's an amazing bravery. Um, every night, people are being rounded up and hunted down. And, you know, with the cell phones um, and all the things that make organizing and protesting better um, are ways for the government to track you. Uh, they are using uh, new technologies, you know, such as uh, kind of internet uh, false uh, cell phone towers to to uh, intercept signals and track people down. So we're seeing enormous bravery of the people. And I, I think it's, they're determined to, uh, I don't see them backing down, even with increased casualty counts. And if anything, it seems to be inspiring more people to take to the streets and be more determined. Um, I imagine the military thinks there will be a point that they will effectively uh, uh, convince or deter the people from coming out in the streets again. Uh, I don't see the military in any mood to negotiate. Um, they've never uh, 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 negotiated with a civilian population like that. Uh, that would be seen as this incredible act of, of weakness um unmanliness and in fact speaking of un unmanliness one of the uh, really interesting things is the the Myanmar military which is just a totally male dominated organization is really quite terrified of women and so the role of female protesters and and things like hanging their saris out in the streets to kind of scare away uh the these uh or benighted men um, is fascinating. Um, uh, but uh, I, I really don't see 
that. And in terms of the civil disobedience movement, it's not clear if anyone is actually running it. Um, so where would the negotiations um, and any demands emanate from? Uh, who would represent the civil disobedience movement right now? Um, it's pretty leaderless so far. Um, but I share your interest um, and, and concern about this because at some point there has to be negotiations, right? There has to be some off-ramp um, or else there's going to be a lot of bloodshed. Uh, however, I don't see negotiations anytime soon, you know, as I'm trying to game this out in the next year, uh, it's really hard for, for me to, to see maybe the military tries to co-opt uh, uh, some of the leaders of certain unions, of certain state-owned corporations, but I don't know. Um, I, I really do think that we are in... Um, uh, a, a fairly leaderless movement um, against a regime that, that views any negotiation as, as a weakness and existential threat to their interests. Thank you, Dr. Abruzza. Any final comments before we wrap up from you? Looks like we have no more questions in the chat. Um, folks um, who are looking for more information about this um, as the situation continues to evolve, um, I imagine they can follow you on Twitter at Zakabuza. Where else should they be uh, looking out for information? Oh, there's so many great uh, scholars. Uh, uh, I always look to Hunter Marston um, and Aaron Conley. Uh, Hunter is based a PhD student at uh, uh, Australian National University. Aaron Conley uh, is uh, with double I double S working on Myanmar and Singapore. Their great insights. On Tuesday mornings, Aaron actually is running a, uh, uh, what's the new audio app? I should know this. Uh, uh, Clubhouse? No, 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 it's Clubhouse, Clubhouse. So he he's doing something every week on, on the Myanmar situation, which has been great to listen to. Um, Melissa Crouch, um, uh, out of Australia does fantastic analysis on, on Myanmar. Um, so there are great resources. On one of the slides, uh, I had the double A, double P, uh, which monitors uh, 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 the uh, uh, political prisoners and arrests in the country. They're a fantastic organization. Myanmar has seen some of the best media, uh, free press in Southeast Asia in a region that has seen such setbacks in free press in the past few years. Uh, always look to the Irrawaddy frontier. Myanmar is a great resource. Um, uh, there, there, there are just some great uh, journalists in the country. Uh, other Western journalists there, Poppy McPherson, it does amazing work. Um, and there, there's so many others. Um, but uh, just one plug, take a look at a, a Radio Free Asia. Um, their Burmese service is fantastic. They do some of the best reporting uh, of, of any US media organization uh, in the country. They're a great resource uh, with great ties to the civil society and human rights community in, in Myanmar. Um, so uh, in full disclosure, I, I, I have a, a, a column with Radio Free Asia, so I, I know I'm biased, but I think their work is, is fantastic. 
Thank you so much for all of those recommendations. And thank you again for joining us today. Um, this has been a really wonderful talk and we got some good discussion going as well. Um, thank you everyone in the audience for joining us. Um, hopefully we will see you again on a, a next, um, a future iteration of the Security Around the World series. Um, and of course, if you are a current student, you know how to find <coughs> Professor Abusa as well. Um, through the Georgetown system. Take care, everyone. Thank you very much for having me.